even though it's such a sweet and perfect song, if your mind gets on too many other things, it's really hard to sing along with it. But I'll share part of what my mind was on, because it was about the song and, and how beautiful it is. As, as we sing it before we pray, it's definitely uh, reflective and a part of the prayer itself, and the same thing when we send it after, or sing it after we pray as well. But I almost wonder if there's a tone that changes as uh, it's more of a question at the beginning and then after the prayer we can have the assurance that it's true. And I don't know how we can uh, begin to, to sing it that way, but it's an interesting thought to, to think about um, and just a, a beautiful song. I know many of you have taken it away with you and just randomly uh, begin singing it throughout the week because sometimes you just need it and it's there for you. As I said at the beginning of the service, we are in Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're just doing verses 1 through 10, and a reminder uh, of Luke chapter 15, it, it's these three parables that Jesus is teaching, and uh, Jesus is around this group of tax collectors and sinners, is what it says, but there's also this group of Pharisees that is around as well, and so uh, Jesus begins to teach this parable about just uh, why there's so much joy here and, and why the Pharisees are having trouble with it, and he goes into these stories. And I want to remind you once again that uh, the par par wow, parable of the prodigal son comes after that, and that's always um, a good parable to read, and I encourage you to do that on your own this week. But here's what the scripture says, either within your bulletin insert, it's there, uh, it's on the screen as well, and then it'll also be in your pew Bible if you want to find that as well. So this is what it says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Then he continues, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God bless the reading and understanding of his holy word. It'd be easier if I knew exactly what it said up there. I'd just make it up, and you guys graciously say something when I'm done. So thank you for that. This morning's parable is one that many of us know, uh, that hopefully many of us have heard before. It's a story of being lost and then found. For one group, it is possibly that simple, being lost and found, but then there's possibly this other group who have just learned that it's not all that exciting to be found. And they don't really learn that it's not all that exciting to be found. They just have trouble rejoicing. Maybe some of you have been there before. You, you understand like how exciting it is whenever a newborn baby is born. You understand how exciting first birthdays can be. But then uh, sometime a, a flip switches inside and it's like, cool, a baby. Hopefully none of you are there yet because you might get in trouble uh, with some other people that are sitting around you. But that's the sense that I get with 
the Pharisees. And so let's back up just a second and figure out why, why the Pharisees are taking a little bit of issue with what Jesus is doing. It's, it's more than just the people that Jesus is hanging out with. It's more than the last week, the, the passage of scripture that we went into that that Jesus was doing these things with repentance and forgiveness that the Pharisees understood only the chief priests can, can forgive sins like this. And it, and it comes through God and there's protocols that you have to go through to be able to get there. It's more than that. And, and the way that it was expressed to me that just really struck home was the way this pastor shared it. He said that his family had just moved to a new house. It was a dream location. It was quiet and secluded at the end of a road near a lake. Everything seemed peaceful. Then on the first Saturday night, they were there. All chaos broke loose. There is loud music and amplified voices making announcements, cheers and fireworks, all going on well into the small hours. And still worse, it was keeping their young children awake. They were appalled. Was this going to happen every single weekend? Where was this noise coming from? And why had nobody told them about it before they had bought the house? Do you sympathize with them a little bit? So in the morning, they were lucky enough that explanations came. And and no, this wasn't going to be a regular occurrence. It would only happen once a year. It was the local yacht club's annual party celebrating some great event in the sailing calendar, and they were able to return to tranquility besides that one night a year. But it left this pastor thinking about how one person's celebration can be really annoying for someone else, especially if they don't understand the reason for the party. And I think that's where the Pharisees found themselves, that Jesus simply put he was he was celebrating he was rejoicing with the people that he had gathered around himself but those are just fancy words the the truth is is jesus really liked to throw a good party jesus still really likes to throw a good party and the pharisees just didn't quite understand that why are you celebrating with these tax collectors and sinners and and why why does it seem like you're throwing a party every single day And so Jesus continues to share the story about why all of this is happening, why he is a party person, and why he's really a party person in each and every single one of our lives. But it's more than that. There was this divide. So whenever uh, the Pharisees were complaining about tax collectors and sinners, this is what they were really complaining about. They were complaining about people that they had already said did not have worth. People that they have already kicked out of the church because of the hoops that you had to jump through. So on the one hand, they didn't like the tax collectors because they collected taxes. For Herod or the Roman Empire, they they collected those taxes, so they weren't, weren't liked for that reason, but they were also pushed out of the church because as a tax collector, guess what? You had to hang out with Gentiles. And then if you hang out with Gentiles, then uh, the people who are in authority within the church said, uh, you are unclean and you are unfit to be here. So they didn't like the tax collectors. Sinners, they don't give us the actual definition that they're using for sinners. Within this, we understand that we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God, but likely what they meant by sinners were people who were too poor to go through the normal chains of being able to repent of their sin. They didn't have the money to have the right animal sacrifices. And eventually, you you get to this point of, of being a sinful being and learn that you can't repent of your sins the right way, and you don't have enough money, and you're cast out enough that you just learn that, well, why, why do I need to repent? Because I can't afford it anyway. So the Pharisees see these tax collectors and sinners, these, these people that Jesus are hanging out with as people with little war- worth. And so Jesus begins to share this story about how profound and perfect this is, and he shares it in a way that hopefully 
uh, everybody can understand, including the Pharisees that are gathered around with him there. And so he goes into this story about lost sheep. He says, don't you understand that if you lose one sheep, but you still have 99 of the rest of them, uh, you go out until you can find that one lost sheep, and then you find it, and you rejoice, and you have a party with all of your friends because you found what was lost and what was important to you. And then maybe he could see it in their brains, but they just weren't quite getting it. So he moves to this image of a woman who loses one of her ten silver coins, and she begins sweeping her house and, and looking all around until she finds it, and there's rejoicing and excitement because she found one of the lost silver coins within her life. And she's so happy to have it back. Then I say that Jesus probably saw within their minds and hearts that they still didn't quite get it. And then he tells the story of the prodigal son. And I'll, I'll touch on it briefly, but you really need to read it to yourself. That there's this man that has two sons. And one son decides, man, my, my dad has all this money and I want to I live life now while I'm still young enough to enjoy it. So if I can go ahead and get my part of the inheritance now... Not to mention that if I get my inheritance now, it is like I'm already asking my dad to have passed away, but his dad loves him so much that he gets the inheritance. And he squanders it all away, all away, until this time that he, he realizes that even the slaves in his father's household have it better than him, and so he's going to go and ask for forgiveness and repent, but... He doesn't even make it down the driveway before his father comes running out to him with forgiveness. And if the other two parables didn't strike home, I think this one probably struck home with uh, the Pharisees that were gathered there. Because we do things in our life that begin to tarnish what society thinks our worth is. I think that's why this passage is hard. We don't necessarily have a, a bunch of a shepherds here that, that knows how hard it is whenever you have 100 sheep and you lose one and you still have 99 and, and you just don't know. And then this other parable that you hear about coins, it's like, coins, yay. Um, but they're silver coins, they're, they're a little bit nicer. But let me share this story with you. It, it actually happened yesterday. It's kind of a hilarious story because... My, my two girls, Addison and Samantha, uh, started having this fight, and towards the end of their fight, I do, I'm like, you do realize this is making the sermon tomorrow, which made Samantha really angry, and then Taryn reminded her that she's in vacation Bible school. But it's a story that starts off even earlier than yesterday, and it's a story that I've shared before with uh, this parable in particular. I remember it almost like it was yesterday. Around the time that my friends and I were got our driver's license, we, we hung out with each other a lot more in, in places that sometimes you had to spend money. And I remember the, the Effingham Walmart is where this happened. We're, we're going out of the store, and, and I have a friend who's, who's throwing pennies and some other loose change on the ground, and I ask him, what in the world are you doing? That's money. He's like, well, a penny's not worth anything. And so that happened then, and then uh, my, my last church, there was, you had the parsonage and an IGA parking lot, and then the church was here. I liked walking to church because it was only like two blocks, um, and you could walk across this IGA parking lot, which is also where uh, the high school kids hung out most nights, and you'd walk across it, and you could at least find uh, 50 cents a week, probably, maybe more than that. I never actually kept track, and uh, now I kick myself because I'm like, I should have kept track because I wasn't the only person that was known to walk through the IGA parking lot to pick up loose change. There is other people around. There's times that we've decided that our coinage doesn't have worth. Which brings me to yesterday and the great story with my kids. Uh, Samantha found um, a penny on the ground, and she was so happy that she found a penny, and I don't know if she is all that excited about the penny, or if she is just excited because she found one and Addison had not, because it drove Addison crazy. And so we eventually talk Addison into, hey, just keep looking, you're bound to find something, and my uh, in-laws were there, 
And I don't know if Addison actually found something or just by the grace and benefit of having uh, grandparents there uh, who also had a car uh, could just reach inside their loose change thing and throw one on the ground. But so the story continues is that uh, while Addison was looking, Samantha had a penny, and during that time, Addison finds a shiny dime. Samantha doesn't know of this quite yet, and so she begins to know that she has more money than just a penny at home, and, and pennies are fun projectiles, so I'll just go ahead and throw it at a grown-up. Addison comes back with a dime, and then guess what? She finds a penny on the ground. So now she has not only her dime, but her sister's penny that had been discarded to the ground. And like fantastic parents that we are, we say, well, Samantha, you lost your penny. Drove them insane. And there becomes this fight that Addison, who understands the worth of a penny and the worth of a dime, and Samantha, who began to uh, underestimate the worth of a penny, once again realizes that a penny has worth because now she doesn't have it. And so we're in this still. It's not just with our kids. It's not just in this parable that sometimes we lose what has worth. I think about it during this time of the pandemic, the, the parable of the lost sheep has come uh, back within my social media a number of times with people explaining the, the need to be vaccinated and the need to wear a mask in congruence with this parable of the lost sheep. And they say, well, if, if it can save just one person, it's entirely worth it, but then we have the other side. And the other side, I, I liken, unfortunately, to the, to the Pharisees and keeper, keepers of the law whose eyes glazed over as Jesus was telling this parable and said, well, I have more than a hundred sheep, and sometimes I lose one, and I don't much care. Or I have uh, all of this change in my car, and every now and then I decide I'm going to throw a penny out the window at somebody. I, I don't care that much about the money. And we begin to miss the point. Because I've even heard it said uh, in current times of, well, the mortality rate is only at whatever percent it is now. And I'm like, first of all, Scripture, who, who talks about uh, having 99, but go, still going out to find the lost one. And second of all, do people actually know what mortality rate calculates? I'm like, you're actually talking about real human beings' lives. I don't care if it's at a fraction of a percent. I don't care if it's at 40%. Like, you have to care about people. But here's the big part of this parable, I think, with Jesus. is Oftentimes we read it and we think that, hey, we're lost. And we just have to find our faith again. And once we find our faith again... Uh, we're going to be found. And while there is some truth to that, here's where the real truth begins to lie. Part of it is when you're lost, you have to be in a place that you can be found. You have to have a heart that says, I'm also trying to be sought out. So you have the sinners and the tax collectors that, yes, they're lost, but they're also in a place that they're able to be found. And when Jesus finds them, there is much celebration. On the other side, you have the Pharisees that, that don't know that they're lost, but continue to try to go through these hoops and rituals that say, hey, I know exactly where God is and God knows where I'm at. And in these small moments of life, when, when God finds the Pharisees a little bit more, they forget about the rejoicing that they can have. Maybe put a better way, there's scripture that happens in Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 44 through 45, that maybe shares it the best. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for a fine pearls, and when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. 
Oftentimes that's another parable that we read that we think is about us, but the truth of the matter is it's completely about God. There's something about each and every single one of you gathered here, every person that is outside the church, that God thinks that they are more precious than Jim. The people that we got mad at this week, the person that cut you off in traffic, the person that you disagreed with on social media, the person that you disagree with and have never uh, forgiven them or continued a relationship with them, God loves them so much that he, he would hide them away and then sell everything just so he could have that piece of property and the gems and the people. These parables might still have you confused. Let me share it one more way. And maybe whenever you hear this, you'll understand how, how perfectly true it is. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, to have eternal life. So often we get confused on uh, what it means to be lost, what it means to be found, what it means to be Christian, what it means to walk in faith when the truth is, is that we just need to put ourselves in a place where we can be found by God. We also need to not be so distracted about all the things that we can do that when we're found, we can also celebrate and rejoice. Let me share one more story with you today. And I think it's so perfect. After, after the Olympics, the, especially in track and field, there were um, Olympic records that were set. There were American records that were set. And uh, in many sports, the Olympics is the pinnacle. After the Olympics is done, the season is over. But in track and field, the international season continues. And so just this, this weekend right now, there is a big track meet in Oregon, and uh, I still follow a lot of track athletes on social media. And the thing that I find so interesting and refreshing about some of them is this, that any time that there is um, a youth event before the track meet, any time that there is a special event uh, or special Olympic event that happens near some of the athletes I follow. Anytime that there is something that has a lot more age groups than just the Olympics or some professional level thing, they're there and they're taking pictures and they're just as excited as if it was their own thing with their own fans. And let me, let me share maybe a little bit more about what I mean. Olympic records were set, American records were set, people ran blazing fast times, but it doesn't matter if you can run a 100 meter dash in less than 10 seconds or less than 30 seconds. There are people that are still so excited, not only to compete, but to also watch you there as well. And that doesn't happen all that often in life. If, if you don't think that you're good enough, you just don't do anything. If you don't think that uh, you can compete, you just let somebody else do it. And finding the joy in those places is amazing. To have enough joy about the things that you do to, to show up to uh, help in vacation Bible school is an amazing thing. To have enough joy in what you do to, to help at the food pantry is an amazing thing. To have enough joy in what you do uh, even when you're not joyous, to show up and allow somebody else to help you out is an amazing thing. But why is it amazing? It's amazing because even in a life where you're told time and time again that you don't have enough worth, God reminds us that you have more worth than you will ever know. Let me finish with just this idea, and it'll be something to take home and think about. So the real cha challenge of these parables for today's church is this. What would we have to do in the visible public world if we were to make people ask the questions to which stories like these are the answer? What might today's Christians do that would make people ask, why are you doing something like that? and giving us the chance to tell stories about finding something that was lost. 
What would we have to do for people to ask, well, why are you celebrating that? Why are you hanging out with those people? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? And think about that this week. As people with insurmountable worth, what do we need to do to make people ask those questions? Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, seems like an understatement to say that today after these parables, we know your love for us. And while we know it, we can't wrap our minds around it, we don't have the language for it. Which is why Jesus told these stories. It's like having a hundred sheep and losing one. It's like having ten silver coins and losing one. It's, it's like having a son that disowns you and he comes back. It's like feeling worthless and realizing that you have uh, more worth than all the riches in this world because you belong to God. We belong to you. Allow us to feel like people with worth. Or don't allow us to hold our worth over others. Allow us to find ways to rejoice with others as, as they find their worth, as they repent, as, as they become closer to you, God. And let us be a part of the party, the rejoicing. And let the joy in the church be so loud that it annoys some people that aren't in it. Just bless us and keep us in everything we say and do. In your gracious name we pray. Amen.